Well, welcome to Ecclesia, and um, I'm doing a little pre-recorded piece here at the front because I actually forgot to hit record during the live session. So this is really to go back and to welcome you uh, to our discussion um, that is a continuation of Faith Across Culture, specifically um, the Golden Rule Conversations. This is the discussion on faith across cultures, the golden rule conversations, which was a continuation of our discussion last week with Anantha Babley as our special guest. Um, I got to thinking about some of the things that came up in that discussion of faith across cultures and his personal journey from India to America, among other countries that he's visited and um, how faith, but also culture play a part in how people live out the golden rule. And just thinking about how widespread that concept is among both cultures and religions. Um, so looking at Islam, for instance, verily Allah enjoins justice and the doing of good to others and giving of good to others. In Hindu, in the Mahabharata, it reads, an individual's social obligation is that one should do unto others, that should not do unto others, that which would cause pain if inflicted on oneself. And in the Baha'i faith, be most loving one to another, and with faces joyous and beaming with light, associate with your neighbor. And in Judaism, from Leviticus, you must not take revenge or bear a grudge against any of your people. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And of course, Jesus' words to the disciples, therefore you should treat people in the same way that you want people to treat you. This is the law and the prophets. This is the common English Bible translation. Um, so I opened this discussion up with what was one of your most memorable moments when someone extended the golden rule to you. And so now we will continue the recording of the live sessions. I was, uh, I was bullied in the sixth grade. We'd moved to uh, California from Mississippi and uh, I talked funny. <laughs> <laughs> So like most kids that are mean. Um, you mean talked. <laughs> well, I lost it, Rick, when, uh, when I moved to California. I was out there for a number of years. I, uh, I lost it. And then um, when I moved back to the Deep South, it came back again. <laughs> <laughs> the way we're in and out. Now that, it's top of, now that I'm paying attention to it, <laughs> I'm trying not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and there was a day in this horrific year that I was being picked on by a gang of girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they caught me out on a playground way out away from the school buildings. And I don't know why there wasn't an adult out there on that outside court, but there wasn't that day. And they literally surrounded me. And I thought, I was a goner. <laughs> this is it. I'm going home. <laughs> and uh, it was absolutely terrifying. I'm, I'm making light of it. But um, this girl, Kari Peterson, who was actually one of the most popular girls in school, was not part of the gang. And she showed up out of nowhere. She didn't really know me. She hadn't really befriend, befriended me. Um, I just knew who she was. And apparently she found out who I was because she stepped up in the midst of those girls that were about to knock me down and grabbed my hand and said, come on, Michelle, you're coming with me. And we walked back and she kept telling me, don't look back, don't look back. <laughs> but it was one of those moments where somebody who really I had no relationship with at that time, total stranger, came to my aid and escorted me back to safety. 
and then ultimately became a friend. Um, so that was a that was one of those days where she did something that she would want done for her, uh, even though she had no emotional attachment to me at that time. And so that's a special time for me. Well, do you remember who these girls were? <laughs> yes, I do. I know a guy. <laughs> that's all right. I've moved on. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll well, share. Go ahead. Mine actually involves Michelle. Oh. <laughs> Last week, during one of the, probably the worst week of my life, Michelle came four times at least, four or five, to visit with my mom in the hospital and then at hospice, with me and my mom and pray. And then when my family all came, she was there for us. And that just meant so much to all of us. And we hope to do that same to friends and family that are going through what we just went through. Thank you. <laughs> you know, when I was in the Army, um, earlier one afternoon, <clears throat> a sort of a race riot started on the fort. And it was a minority group against, you know, other, you know, white people. And this minority group was running down the street and they were going to grab me and throw me in a bar ditch because they'd done that to several other people. And one of them yelled out, don't, don't, it's Tom. Because I always tried to get along with everybody. And they just kind of swerved around me. And Tom, <clears throat> later that, Tom, Tom you need yeah. to explain. Uh, it's not. I mean, they call it John, so make sure oh. that you're also Tom. Okay, yeah, it's my full name's John Thomas Foster, and I go by Tom. And you know, I I tried to get along with everybody, and I guess that paid off because they said, "Don't, oh, it's Tom," and they went around me, and continued on and let. It, Later that night, I was on guard duty, and I had to put myself inside of a tank and lock it up because they were going around me and helicopters everywhere. But I thought that was really unusual when they were coming after people, and they just said, it's Tom, go around me. And I felt very thankful for that because it was pretty scary. But like I say, I tried to get along with everybody. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been trying to connect this to faith. And so I added this late today. When someone extends a golden rule to us, does it impact your faith or understanding of their faith in any way? I think going back to uh, my story, I, I know for a fact that girl um, had faith in God. I know she was a Christian and um, she was probably living out uh, her faith. You know, sometimes I think we, in, in, in a politically correct culture, we tend to say, the golden rule, or we tend to say um, it's just the right thing to do. And I don't discount that. I just kind of wish that people would feel more comfortable saying, yes, it's the right thing to do, but it's also what my faith guides me and instructs me to do. Um, I don't know. Does anybody else feel that way? Sometimes I wonder if we do that by intuitive intuition or do we consciously say, oh, this is my faith and that's why I should act like this. You know, um, I guess we're just being human in, um, in just doing what, what is right at that moment uh, rather than being conscious that I'm a Christian, so this is a Christian thing to do. Um, 
I guess what is a Christian thing to do is also a Buddhist thing to do, an Islamic thing to do, a Hindu thing to do, you know, a Baha'i thing to do, a Jewish thing to do. I'm thinking like, I mean, that's probably what, um, because there, there are universal ethics uh, and, uh, and there are faith-specific ethics, which actually may not be that different. Uh, I think all faiths probably have the same ethical constructs. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we don't do the the right thing and don't think until later if it's the golden rule or whatever it is. It says in this moment, this is the thing to do, and it's not until you either a you look back at it or the person or people you've helped make that leap. Mm -hmm. I don't think someone does something originally by saying, we'll be the golden rule on this. I think they just do it. And then it's in, everything else is in, in retrospect. retrospect. Yeah. yeah. I have, I kind of have to agree only because I have, I have quite a few friends who are atheists. Um, and they're some of the nicest people who have been there for my wife and I, and they, they do it just to do it because it's to be human and to be kind and, um, and faith never comes in on that. It's just because they want to be a kind person and, and show that everybody's the same. Maybe at some point it becomes a, a nature versus nurture thing that the golden rule is something that you taught or you learned somewhere and the more you see it and around you the more you unconsciously learn to do it yourself i would agree with that yeah i don't know if necessarily you can say it's a um or religious or um a godly thing or it's just a thing I mean, look at look throughout history. There are people that have been steeped in religion and piety and and faith in God that have done some of the most horrendous things on the planet. The Spanish Inquisition, for example. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, they knew the golden rule, and yet, don't say. But it's not necessarily a, um, the golden rule doesn't exactly lend itself exclusively to um to religion i think it's more of a of a personal uh thing of course again i could be full of crap <laughs> <laughs> you always say that well i usually am <laughs> all right anybody have anything else on this before we move on to the deep thinking questions well <laughs> That situation I was in and that, at that fort, I was just minding my own business walking down the road. I didn't even know this was starting up. And these this group of guys were running toward me. And when they yelled that out, you know, I started thinking about it because, you know, when I was in the Army, I tried to be friends with everybody because if I ever had to go in combat, that might be the guy next to me that saves my life. Sure. And that's the way I thought about it. I didn't think about it as race or anything else. I thought of it as, you know, a team, you know, where we could, you know, protect each other. And so I was the same to everybody. And then it was nice to see that that was noticed when those guys were, I mean, they were aggressively coming toward me. And I was just walking across the street i didn't even know this stuff was starting up and they said don't don't it's tom and they went around me and it was a really a good feeling to know that i was remembered as being you know the same as everybody else but john that was just hmm? when when did that happen was that uh, back in the back in the 60s it was in the early 70s. Oh, okay, all right. 
when Vietnam was winding, it was before uh, Saigon fell. All right, all right. But I didn't have to go over there, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Uh, they were training me for it. <laughs> all right. Uh, <clears throat> so you mentioned this, and it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about equity right now. Um, let me change my screen so I can see this better. Um, I, I was curious what um, the difference was between equity and equality. Because uh, growing up, we talked so much about equality, but lately the, the, the term that's thrown around is equity. Um, and so I found this, I thought this was a, a helpful visual for me, but um, I just Googled this the other day and um, I found a definition that said equality means the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. And equity means justice according to natural law or right, or the quality of being fair and impartial. So what does this mean in society? Equity is the means to get there. Um, we talk a lot about equity and there's things online uh, going around right now, equity challenges, everything that has kind of um, cropped up probably even more um, available, I would say, readily available since the Black Lives Matter movement uh, got more notoriety recently. Um, and uh, so uh, many members of Ecclesia have been very much focused on this um, and really wanting to do more equity work. Um, and so my mind's kind of been in that and relating the concept of the golden rule uh, with equity work. And so sometimes I run down a number of rabbit holes and I apologize guys if I'm doing that. Uh, <laughs> um, I do that a lot actually, but um, Richard Rohr wrote this and it really jumped out at me as a, uh, thinking about, you know, what we've, we've been talking about the systems that need to change, but in, in Ecclesia, we've been talking about before a system can change, we have to change. And so this really spoke to me that the word change normally refers to new beginnings, but the mystery of transformation more often happens, not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart. Um, so then I thought, well, you know, what, what do I see needing to fall apart in myself to advance equity? Thoughts? It's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing is you have to realize or understand that there is something that needs to fall apart. And I think that's the you know, once you can answer that, you know, then you can figure out what to fix it. But how many people go through life blind, uh, happily blind to what should change? Because they're just happy with it. Because they don't know anything else. You know, I was thinking about this today because, you know, I always try to have an answer as well and not just lay it all on you guys. Although I think you're smarter than I am in, in a lot of areas. And so I feel very blessed to have this circle of people. Um, but I was thinking about what would need to fall apart in myself. And Anantha, your story last week about the girl with the t-shirt came to mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you had this arrogance in that moment with yeah. having a PhD and that you um, being of another race yourself would understand uh, better than some others. And uh, 
but it was your your I think you used the term arrogance yeah. uh, that made her want to sit down, sit down. I want to talk to you about this. And, and I uh, I thought, you know, I kind of do that too, um, where um, I think just because I love everybody uh, that I am that I already know uh, what needs to happen or what uh, my next step needs to be. And I forget that sometimes, no, I really don't because I have not walked in those shoes. Right. You know, I, yeah, I've been bullied, but that I haven't, I haven't endured uh, some of the things other people have. And, and I, I need to just stop and remind myself step one, what needs to fall apart is that I think, that I know, and I need to just stop thinking that and start listening. Yeah, I've made a point when somebody goes through something that I haven't gone through or I don't understand, I tell them, I don't understand this because I have not lived this, but I can empathize with you and I can listen to you because I don't understand because I have not been through it. <clears throat> I wonder if when the society as a whole goes through what Black Lives Matter movement uh, made us, you know, literally forced us to look at ourselves. Uh, that's a watershed movement. Um, and I think it made me definitely question my attitudes, my beliefs, and my subconscious um, thinking or intuitive action that could reflect insensitivity, uh, you know, or arrogance too, you know. Um, all of a sudden it taught me to be humble, um, to, uh, to recognize people with you know, feelings, you know, they, they, you know, genuinely go through instead of making assumptions. Um, so it just kind of made me wake up. And maybe that's what society needs, uh, a traumatic event or a series of events that make us question ourselves. I, it's funny because just in the conversation last week to this week and talking about Black Lives Matter, one of the big things of, of you talking about the girl with the t-shirt and saying stop, sit down, yeah. was that you took the time to listen and you, you wanted to listen. You had, you wanted to have an understanding and empathy and I think John hit it when he said empathy was one of the key things. Um, my sister, I'm mixed. My sisters are both white. My mom's white, my dad's black. Um, and I've had this conversation with my sister many times of like, where I've been followed around stores. I've been pulled over and held without being told why I was pulled over. Um, and I would talk to my sister about these things and she would never understand. She would never listen. It was always like, well, that's, that's not the case. You're overplaying it. Like they, they would have held me to um, and it wasn't until this movement that my sister finally turned to me and said, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I wasn't listening. She wasn't having the empathy of understanding that things are just that little different. That I, I live in a predominantly white neighborhood, which does have a lot of racism and is known, the, the sheriffs here are known for not being the nicest to anybody of color. Um, but it took something big for her to see that and this movement to really take notice, to stop and go, I'm so sorry I didn't listen. I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't have an understanding of, of what you were talking about when you kept mentioning being followed around stores or ha walking into a store and just somebody, I could walk in and be like, hi, how are you? And have someone turn you away and go, what are you doing in my store? Um, 
so I think you're right. It did take and still continues to take for people to open their eyes and then to take that moment to stop, listen, and, and have an empathy and understanding for something that you m might not be going through, but they're going through. It, and I'm seeing that more and more as these conversations come up and, and I've had friends call me and say, what can I do? I don't, like, I don't understand why this is going on. I didn't understand what, what I was doing without even realizing it, that I was helping this thinking that, no, everything's fine. I don't know what these people are talking about. Um, but I do, I think that really it, it is, it is taking that moment and having empathy for others. And I think that's really what needs to happen more often than not. I don't, I don't see people having, even for those that aren't understanding, for those that are very much of like Black Lives, like here we have um, Blue Lives Matter and I mean, here it's been kind of strange, but having an empathy from where they're coming from having an empathy for even though they don't understand black lives matter have an understanding of why don't they understand and what can i do to have that conversation um one of the things also it doesn't help being gay um i had somebody when came and i first started dating that was very anti-gay he would make it very clear that and he'd, when we were in college, he'd make it very clear, like he'd get up and he'd leave a table. He'd make rude comments. And finally, I just, I sat down with him and I said, I need to understand what is your problem with us? I've always been nice to you. I've always tried to talk with you. We've never done anything for you to say these mean things and do these things to us. And so we had that conversation and it took that, it took, he finally stopped. I mean, he finally sat down, he had the conversation with me and was like, I get where you're coming from. This was my belief. This is not something I should be affecting you with. And, and finally things calmed down, but it took me stopping and going, don't just be angry. Don't be mad that he's being mean. Don't ignore it. But stop and try and have that calm conversation of what's going on and listening to them even when it's really hard <laughs> um so yeah that, i mean that's really my thing is to listen and, and just take the time have the empathy have the understanding who else Roy or Dorothy, have any thoughts? Have any thoughts? Do you have any thoughts? I'm trying to uh, the statement on the Golden Rule conversation there, the word change normally refers to new beginnings. But the mystery of transformation often happens not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart. And then I read what you have there. What do you see needing to fall apart in yourself to advance equity? And I wonder if if I'm guilty of something that creates inequity, I, I don't say that well, but it's it apply it, to me. It implies that the only way change could come and so far as I am concerned I would uh, need to have uh, something change that is leads to inequality 
in me. I'm, I'm not saying it well. I'm, I'm just thinking about that. I got you. I think it's okay. making this to me. The um, another way I'm looking about this, what you see needing to fall apart. Think of the, the fabled phoenix, it rose from its own ashes, and that's kind of what this is talking about itself, with us seeing. Um, things in ourselves that we should change, it's much like dying and being reborn. Is our, um, is, is our, um, our baptism and acceptance of Jesus for those of us who are Christian, um, that in itself seems to be only the start. I think it's a lifelong process. Well, if you're baptized at, yeah. at birth or when you're very young, not much of a, of a choice there. You know, I think that things like, like this need to happen as you're older and you get some wisdom or had some life experiences with you. Um, I mean, in, in my case, I was 27. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, when I was baptized. So I had, had a chance to learn a bit. Um, to learn what worked, what was good, what wasn't, and what I needed and wanted to change. But just merely being baptized when you're either at birth or at a very young age, you haven't learned anything yet. You're, you're too new at it. So I think that's more of a of an age-related thing or, or maturity, if not age. Well, and I'm not really speaking specifically of baptism itself, but in, of course, in our tradition, you're nine or 10 years old. Yeah. But just that moment in life where you... Uh, choose your faith. Okay. I guess is really more what I was referring to. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's only the beginning because I think we just have, there's just so much, there's so many things that, that, um, that perhaps impact our ability to um, advance equity or to change for some other reason that if, if, there, if there needs to be, um, and, and as far as letting something old fall apart, we've all got something that we can work on. I think what you said was really profound that equity is a path to equality. That's, that's a good way to remember the difference between the two, you know, um, and it's sort of a, what's, what's the role I can play in, in fostering equity that, so that we can all have equality, you know, probably that's where I can begin to make an impact is work on equity, not on equality, because equality is, is means a lot to a lot of people, different things, and uh, but equity, I think, gives gives a tangible uh, choice to intervene and say, this is what I should do to attain, you know, equity which then becomes a path to equality eventually. So that's, uh, that's really a good difference that I gained today in this gathering. Well, 
Here, here's another one. Thich Nhat Hanh's quote is, when you understand, you love. And when you love, you naturally act in a way that can relieve the suffering of people. <clears throat> yeah, the... Uh, oh, sorry. Ahead. What we call the primate of the Episcopal Church. Uh, he's the head priest of the whole national church. <clears throat> and... Um, He's a black gentleman, but he says some of the most profound things. And he asked one time, what's the opposite of love? And of course, everybody was going to hate. And he goes, no, it's selfishness. Mm -hmm. We become selfish to wow. other people. I thought that was pretty profound. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. that. I've heard the opposite of love as indifference, but I think selfishness is definitely a more, a, a better uh, description. Oh yeah, I think it was, is a more all around description for, for things. Because so many things that are, if not wrong, that could change, can be pointed directly back to selfishness. Mm -hmm. um, even the point that no, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mitchell. Okay. No, no, I was just clearing my throat. Sorry. I'm, I'm getting you. That's it. I like that you said that, uh, John, because um, when I read this, I first thought, well, when you when you understand, you love. Well, I thought. Well, who's going to say I'm going to go that far with it? <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at it in terms of the opposite of selfishness, uh -huh. once you understand, it's hard to be, I mean, I guess I suppose you could still be selfish, but you'd be less so, I think, if you truly understood. Right. Looking at it in that respect, then I could see how it, you could love. Uh-huh. You know, because the, the next part of this, it, it does feel like that just falls in place then, like it says, naturally acts in a way to relieve the suffering of people. All right. Any other, good. Any other thoughts on that one before I go to the next one? I just, to me, it feels like, again, empathy. Like when you understand, when you can empathize and understand where somebody is, whether it's a loss, whether it's, you know, pain, a surgery, whatever it is, when you can look at it and go, I'm, and, and be like, I'm sorry that you're going through this. What can I do to help? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, one of our Ecclesians has a daily devotional book that she shared with me recently. And this jumped out at me. Hugh Prather has written a number of books. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. I wasn't. But one of the chapter headings said this, how could one person's way be superior to another person's way if God is leading us all? Hmm. This opens up a, I mean, you know, this could open up a whole can of worms of predestination and everything. I could just see all <laughs> kinds of directions with this. But I just think in general, um, it, that's another way of saying trusting in God rather than trying to trust in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Um, look at, uh, being from Detroit, I'll use another analogy. What part of the car is most important? Is it the engine? Is it the tires that, that turn the car? Is it the air conditioning that keeps the car cool? Is it, is it you know, the, the transmission? The answer is none of it. They're all equally important right. to, to make something happen. That's exactly what, what this is. There is no one's, no one's way is superior in one sense or another, eventually they all dovetail. 
to a greater understanding. So. I really like that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and one thing I've learned about education, education to me is a very humbling thing because it makes me realize how much I really don't know and makes me cognizant of the fact, regardless of what the person I see coming toward me or I'm going toward to talk to, never assume that you're smarter than that person because it doesn't know what, you don't know what, it, you know, what's inside of them. And when I make that assumption, I, it's more easy, it's easier for me to make contact with people because I realize you know, our ability to have all this knowledge is very limited. And the more we learn, the more humble we become because we learn we have to have this dependency on God. <clears throat> and uh, I just try not to assume that I'm ever smarter than anybody. And, you know, I'm open to listen. And I think just the humbling fact of education has just made me realize the more I learn, the less I know I know. And so it makes me more prone to listen to other people, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just wish we could clone you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just found a quote which I love from Einstein. Everyone's a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to, to climb a tree, it'll take it, you'll spend its entire life thinking it's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's really true. Um, everyone has something that they're absolutely brilliant at. And whether it matches our perceived idea of brilliance about something has nothing to do with it. So, I mean, that's something I think we all have to understand and get over. That everyone is in their own right, in their own way, is a genius. The thing right. that we have to do is to um, help them discover that and bring that out. Um, because that might bring out ours. Except in the case of me. It's like when Gandhi went to uh, Heathrow Airport when they were uh, fighting the colonial era. You might collect, correct me on this, Anantha, but they said, Mr. Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, Anantha told me this story. What do you think of Western civilization? He goes, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> and the reporter sat there and thought, you know, look what all India had to go through because of Western civilization. Sure. And that thought's always stuck with me. Any other thoughts on this or as it pertains to equity? What do you think, Michelle? Doing some heavy stuff on us uh, today, mm -hmm. Michelle. Is it too much? Is it too heavy? <laughs> I know, actually, it's thought provoking. Yeah, I like that. I I uh, I thought I thought you guys would be able to keep up with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're challenging us too. That's good. That's good. <laughs> good. Well, my dad's on the call, and at one point he said, "I think I'm growing." And so now the, cha the gauntlet has been thrown to make sure he continues to grow. <laughs> he has a birthday this week, actually, in, uh, oh, no, not quite. Maybe five more days? Yeah. Really? August 14th. Yeah, we should go back down there. On Friday. Friday. He'll turn 21. Birthday. I think we should go down and celebrate. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, Daddy, did you have anything to add on this last thing before I go on? Or Mom? No, Mom. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I actually stumbled on this quote right after our friend Tracy Mulvaney, who's not on tonight, uh, asked me, what is our path? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> because Ecclesia's tagline is, find your path to God. And she's like, but what is our path? <laughs> she wanted me to define it for her, which of course I'm never going to do. <laughs> but I saw this and uh, I thought, you know, it, it is true to me. The path is all about the journey, not the destination. Yeah. But I loved this quote and, and I, I find myself gravitating to it in a number of ways because all of that heady stuff that that I threw at you to that tonight, uh, as well as a bunch of the other things I've read in the last week, um, the conversations that I've had. Um, I mean, I won't even go into it, but it's just to the point where I can get lost in it and go down a million rabbit holes, and I am I am a kid in a candy store, and um, and then I have to say, Michelle. What does it matter if you're not doing anything with it? <laughs> and so for me, the, to, to, to live, to, uh, I don't know, mute that. Um, for me to, to have all of the knowledge and encouragement uh, and, uh, vision and inspiration is wonderful and necessary and f probably is the the fuel for the engine um but to me it doesn't matter i can read all this really cool stuff and talk to really cool people but if if i don't if it doesn't spur some positive um action uh, then to me, it's like all for naught. Um, I don't know. Does anybody else feel that way? Yes. And I just found something that could be appropriate to this. And I'll hold it to the camera. Can okay. you read that? Okay. Not all yeah. those who wander are lost. Yes. Not all those who wander are lost. Hmm. That's huh. okay. Kind of, you know, kind of goes to what we're talking right here, and and that goes along with yeah. with our spiritual journey as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not more it's just it's not random wandering. It's every step you're exploring something else, and it's you know, leading you down another path. If you allow it to, or if it's intentional, you think. No. no, I guess not. I guess it's all, it's, it's all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, this goes back to whatever path you go down is the one you're supposed to. <laughs> I actually, I wholeheartedly believe that. Mm -hmm. See, Michelle? Um. <laughs> 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 Where can I get into it over <laughs> I'm a free will girl. <laughs> 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 I think I, I I believe we have free will, but I also believe that you're still going to it's how you get to your end result. You have the choices that you make. There still will be an end result that will take you to another path. I mean, um, one of the things my wife and I always talk about was that we were always meant to be together we had our paths going side by side and it wasn't until we were ready to meet each other that it crossed. We lived in the same neighborhood. We went to the same schools. We grew up in the same area from the age of five all the way to college, but we didn't actually meet and really connect until college. And it was, it, our paths would cross when it was ready to cross when the decision was, when we were ready to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you do have free will in, in some things, but the path will always take you where you need to be. 
Good point. It's just kind of, yeah. that's kind of how we always function too. <laughs> and it works. It does. You meet some amazing people. There are some amazing places that we've been. Um, we have an ongoing joke that when we travel, because we've been lost a few times, um, but we always call it an adventure because we've met some amazing people that we never would have met if we hadn't gotten lost. Um, it's always an adventure. There's always something to to do or someplace to meet someone new. Um, so yeah, it's a good path to walk. Yeah, how about those two guys wandering up the road to Emmaus? <laughs> you know, that must have been a a real adventure when they realized who they were walking with. The resurrected Christ. And and that's just it. If we if we treated everyone we met along the way of our wandering as if they were Christ. Right. Good point. Yeah, I mean it's just very good point. Because you, you you don't know. Actually, in one sense, nor should you. You shouldn't take any idea that you everyone if you treat everyone like that, yes, you're gonna meet someone along the way and it's going to be that way. And it also spreads that message along. So. That's good. Thank you. All right. Well, to wrap it up, um, I decided to say, okay, what can we do personally? And what could we do perhaps as a group in taking some golden rule action that is um, timely with current events that, is going on. So obviously first I always ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance in all things um, and confronting and addressing my own bias or fear through prayer and through action, whether it's educating myself more, or talking with someone who has a different perspective, being prepared for the hard work of reconciliation um, and a large part of that is just being patient, but being patient, kind, and merciful in all circumstances and approaching conversations from a position of listening and understanding, not a win-lose position. This came up recently. Uh, I was on a, a living room conversation actually about um, politically correct discourse. And um, one of the people on the call said, he, he's a federal agent. And he said, you know, it got so much better when I quit approaching every confrontational conversation from a position of win or lose. And when I quit doing that, I started understanding and so he's trying to do that more and he was sharing that and I thought what a what a great practice because especially if we're going into something that is foreign or uncomfortable uh regardless of the the topic or the nature if it is something that we are um particularly um uh we're we're already going in with a preconceived notion of how this was going to end we're already in the win lose mode and um, so I thought that was really good advice. And um, if anybody has anything else that we should add to this list, then uh, please share for personal action. Be open. Be open? Oh, be, be open? Yeah, be open and just be quiet. Uh, and just listen to what moves you in the quiet moments of your life. Anyone else have anything we should do as personal action that helps you? <clears throat> okay. Um, on group action, I want to invite you to do one of these with me. I've decided to, to choose one and do it. So let me tell you, um, are you, show of hands, who's familiar with the 21 day equity challenge? Okay, yay, I have a whole new fresh 
fresh brew here. Um, this came up actually in May when um, the whole, uh, the Black Lives Matter, but more even before that, just the initial uh, protests really started uh, coming up. Oops, I thought I took, I took a picture of something. I'm trying to pull it up here so I can reference it. Um, they started doing a 21 day equity challenge online. Now that time has passed, but the, the information is still out there and you could still do it on your own. Um, for one thing a day for 21 days, you commit to, to doing something that um, helps you grow in understanding and, and equitable work. So the challenge is pick one of the resources that's provided, uh, listed every day for 21 days, diversify your understanding by doing some of each, track and reflect by using the planning tool that they provide, share your reflections at the end of the challenge, um, and pray for places you are challenged and for those you are learning about whose lives may be different than yours. Um, I, I would suggest that if we do this as a group, we pick the same tool and be using that and then maybe have a once a week uh, call to just uh, touch base with each other on it and encourage each other um, as we go through the 21 days, but just maybe have a weekly connection. Um, so that's one option. Um, the other option is my neighbor's voice or a living room conversation. Now we have a member of Ecclesia, Teresa, who does host living room conversations regularly for her rotary group. And um, they have a number of subjects you can choose from, but the point of both of these, they're basically moderation processes to be able to moderate a conversation around highly sensitive subjects. So, um, and maybe in the case of equity related topics, um, you know, Black Lives Matter is a, a perfect example because <clears throat> one person's perspective is on the concept of Black Lives Matter. Another person's perspective is on the organization Black Lives Matter and what is coming out of that. And then there's the Blue Lives Matter that Rachel mentioned. And so um, having a conversation that one might inform people more, because I feel very uh, uneducated about a lot of it, um, <clears throat> but it's a way of doing it where it is, you follow specific steps so that everyone is heard and everyone um, can listen and actually hear all these perspectives. So it's, it's really a, a way of moderating a conversation. Um, and we would probably pick a couple of current event topics that are things that we really may reference on these calls, but that we haven't really um, dove into those. And, and this would give us a chance to do that. Um, and to invite other people to those conversations as well, Just people, you know, in our regular lives that uh, you might not have invited to Ecclesia, but they definitely would want to be on a conversation about one of those um, current events. And then uh, the third option is actually on hold because I'm waiting to hear back from the connection. But uh, those of you who aren't familiar, Week of Compassion is an organization that is uh, more than a week. And it is the it's the refugee and relief arm of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And so they do global work, um, but they're doing a ton of work stateside um, and it's heavily volunteer driven. And so because of COVID-19, they've really dialed back a number of the projects that they would normally do just out of an abundance of caution for the volunteers. But one thing that they are still doing through COVID and it's specific to COVID-19 is this farm to family food boxes. And it sounds real interesting. They're, they're partnering with another organization on this and that's who I'm trying to, to reach. Um, but 
the concept is the fact that the food chain, the supply chain is broken in some areas. The farm food and the processing piece of it um, and it's still creating additional issues of getting food for food scarcity locations. Um, and so <clears throat> they're, they're finding a way around that is, is essentially what they're doing. And so it would be an opportunity for us to do that. Um, and we could probably um, um, do that in our respective areas too, because they're doing it all over the United States. Um, once I get more info, I can let you know about that. But I just feel like uh, it'd be, it's timely uh, to do one of these things. And I, I'm going to do one, but I would like to, you know, invite you guys to join me in doing that and see, you know, if there's something that you feel that you would really, if you feel passionately one way or the other and, and what you'd like to do with me. And then I will start a list and get us together outside of this call to, to start doing one of these projects. Unless there's something else out there as well that one of you is aware of, um, that's another option that we could do perhaps as a group. Arson doesn't count, does it? <laughs> Person does not count in this case. <laughs> Who are you during the Inquisition? <laughs> All right, well, you can reach out to me uh, later, text me, email me, and let me know your thoughts if you want to join me in doing one of these things. The 21 day equity challenge is not a hard thing. It's like, it's probably 15 minutes a day. Um, and it's just taking one thing each day to do um, toward, you know, equity work in ourselves um, and perhaps reaching out. But what I've seen so far is things that we can do on our own, but I would just, I think it would be a good thing to do to support each other, knowing that we do it as a group. So you can just let me know. Um, could, could that project be uh, uh, international in scope? For 21 day equity challenge? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I would think so. I don't know, that, I haven't dug into all of the specifics for all 21 days, but I would imagine it would be. Well, the only difference would be, uh, since it would be international, it would be metric. Metric? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh. <laughs> that was a great eye roll, Michelle. <laughs> so it could be also uh, 23.5 days? Yes, that would be it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be it. <laughs> All right. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope you've gotten something out of it yeah, tonight. Yeah, wonderful. Yes. Um, and before anyone, uh, we'll, we'll close in, in prayer here in a minute and ask for some joys and concerns to be shared as well. But before you hang up, Anantha and John, I need to make sure I have your mailing addresses because I want to send you something special. Okay, you want me to text it? or to Sure, it? you can text it to me. Okay, yeah. I'll text Can you text me John Thomas's too? Tom? Yeah. You te text me your address or email me your address? Sure, be glad to. Okay. Hey, All right, well, don't worry, uh, don't worry. Rick? What? Oh, just, I would just warn him that if they get something powdery, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, before you go, Dad had a funny joke about the golden rule. Dad, uh -huh. can you tell him your joke, your golden rule? I forgot how it goes. Uh, I just asked. I asked Michelle uh, if the golden rule was do one to others before they do one to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's also an allegory of he who with the gold rules. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Well, let's see. It, it sounded funny yep. at breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thank you all for joining tonight. Does anyone of have any joys or concerns? Michelle, and thank you, everybody. Yes, yeah, thank you. For the Rachel, week. thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. Oh. I'm I'm so happy that I get to talk with you, and I'm sorry I couldn't stay last week to hear more. Uh -huh. oh. Sue will continue to pray for you and your family. Thank you. I do have two families to pray for um, this week. Um, my friend Anton lost his father this last week. Um, we had, he was one of the ones we prayed for a couple weeks ago, and then my friend Gail ended up losing her cousin as well. Um, on on some of the blessings we've had, I have a brand new nephew. Ah, um, so I'm right. very excited. I haven't been able to meet him. He's across the country, but um, he was born this last week as well. So is he across the country in South in North Carolina? He's in Illinois. Oh, okay. And still on the other side, but. <laughs> It is Illinois, though. Uh, I just want to <laughs> pray for travel mercies for those who are on the road and uh, for me and Dave for health. Uh, I, I think I think we're I think we're coming out of it a lot sooner than I thought we were when we when it started. But uh, it's still scary because every any time you have a sniffle, you think it's COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, Especially when your allergies hit and you're just like, okay, is this allergies? Or was I exposed to something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, would someone, I'll, I'll start us. Would someone like to finish us in prayer? Um. <laughs> sure. All right, I'll start it and, uh, and then I'll pause, Tom, and you can pick up. Okay. All right. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. And we have so much to be, to, to rest in you with. We thank you for the new birth. And we thank you for our health. And Lord, we thank you for the peace that comes even among our losses. Thank you for the arms that you wrap around us, yours, your spirits, and those of friends and family. And Lord, we pray for the travel mercies for those who are on the road this week and couldn't be with us. And just that you would bring them home safely and back into our circle. Dear Lord, <clears throat> I pray that we have a desire for <clears throat> equity in our society to um, achieve <clears throat> more of a quality in the country now. The country seems somewhat divided. <clears throat> Please let uh, our society accept its own diversity because I feel that in our own diversity, we are safer when we respect each other as one. And I pray that this <clears throat> can happen in uniting our country together with all and see the pleasure of it in the, the quality of diversity. Because I think it gives, I believe it gives us strength <clears throat> in our government and our personal lives and all of those around us and those that we love and thank you dear lord for sending the presence of your holy spirit and being with us through the holy spirit as we <clears throat> live in this complex world that we live in and follow you and have faith in you dear god 
In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.